preparation has been traveling. Um, no, it's amazing to be back here. Um, Steph and I just walked out the field and said some great memories from, from here. So it sparks a lot of energy. I uh, just want to get the game started. Obviously there's some jet lag and such, but right now that's not the focus. It's the sunshine and it's the grass and it's the game coming up. And then I can imagine it's going to be a really good vibe at the stadium as well. And that energy is going to carry the, the players through some, some tight legs as well. Uh, so really excited. Steph, it's a sold out crowd. Over 50,000 people are expected at the game. As a proud Melbourneian, how does it feel to prepare and be on the verge of Olympic qualification here? Yeah, it feels amazing. Um, we absolutely love just coming back to Australia whenever we can. Um, and obviously every time we're playing here at the moment, we're getting massive crowds. And I think that, like Tony said, that gives us a lot of energy. And um, we've been looking forward to this game for a long time. And the fact we got a good result in Uzbekistan and we can come here and um, yeah, just play some, some good football in front of a great crowd. We're really looking forward to it. Anna Harrington, AAP. Yeah, hi Tony. Um, welcome back to Melbourne. Uh, you mentioned Preparation's been travelling. In terms of squad rotation, how heavily do you expect to rotate your squad? And uh, specifically, is Caitlin Ford fit to start? And do you look at Michelle Heyman starting as well? Uh, both of them are definitely options to start, uh, especially considering Heyman's performance when she came off the bench. Um, Caitlin, we knew we had to adjust her load a little bit coming in. Uh, we'll see in training today how she looks in terms of how many minutes and then whether we use those minutes from start or in the second half is always a plan of, of 90 minutes. Uh, you might see a couple of rotations but we also need to um, remember or I remind you that I also think consistency and chemistry is key. You've seen that over the years uh, and also we don't have that many games before the Olympics. We haven't qualified yet, so we need to focus on one game, but it's not just a game to qualify, it's also a game to get minutes preparing for a potential Olympics as well. So finding that right balance between uh, consistency and get playing time together and get that chemistry together, but also give some players a, a chance. Um, we look at training today, how many minutes some of those players have, and that can influence one or two positions that I know more of after training today, because we haven't trained since we left uh, Uzbekistan. Laura. Hello both, uh, Laura from Channel 7. Uh, Tony, just on the chemistry in the forward line, how do you see that going at the moment where you obviously are trying to fill that gap left by Sam? Um, you did get some experience with that during the World Cup when she was unable to play, but how do you see that progressing? And, and Steph, how are you finding being the captain? How is that sitting with you so far? And do you chat to Sam at all or is she like, no, nah, I'm going to stay at arm's length? Do you want to answer this? Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, we could either go a, a route where we say, OK, last time we played here in this stadium, last time we played in Melbourne against Canada, uh, we could put the same lineup up with two false nines with Mary and EVE that did a phenomenal job when we beat Canada 4-0 and we had speed on the wings with Caitlin and Rasso and we let Steph and Ellie attack and, and fly down the wings and, and those false nines kind of linked in a, in a four-box midfield kind of thing and we were very effective at that. So that is a tactic we could keep using. Instead of using a pure out-and-out -out nine, we can use two false nines like EVE and Mary, for example, if we want to have continuity since the World Cup. But one of the reasons we brought in Heyman as well is to look at what does it look like if you play with an out and out nine and kind of replace Sam, not with, should, shouldn't compare players like that, but more like a pure nine kind of player. There's a couple of other players in, in the roster that can do that as well. You saw in, when we played Uzbekistan that I moved Rasso up as a nine for a little bit during the game. She played as a nine over here when we scored against France and won 1-0 when Sam was on the bench. If we want speed in the nine, she's an option up there as well. Um, we have a couple of options, but that is a part of preparing for the Olympics as well to see what options do we have. Some of them we already know about, but it's also time to test something new, question mark. Uh, yeah, in regards to... Um, being the captain and, and Sam's role, I think I'm still very much leaning on Sam and she's very much involved in um, a lot of the decision making and things that we talk about. Um, yeah, she's an incredible leader and someone that's very, very important to this team. So we're absolutely still involved in talking about things. And I did, I did ask her right at the beginning, um, you know, if she ever feels like it's too much and she's got obviously so much to deal with and so much to focus on with her, her injury and getting back. So I, I definitely put it out there that if it's too much, she doesn't want to be involved at whatever point. She's obviously um, more than welcome to step away, but she cares about this team so much. So she, she's definitely very much on top of everything and um, I'm still leaning on her for a lot of things. So uh, it's nice to have her there. And then um, obviously we've got 
many wonderful leaders in the team as well. This team's so experienced, so there's lots of different people stepping up in different areas. Joey and then Luke. Uh, Joe Lynch for various, I guess. Um, sorry, uh, you've talked a bit in a previous Olympic qualifiers as well about trying to break down low blocks and playing through lines. You got a chance to go up against the low block against these specs. I guess what from that game did you learn from the film session and the like, and maybe what are some of the things you'll be looking to improve on in the coming game? And then as a follow up to both, you mentioned you'd had a look at the pitch. We've had Pink performing on that pitch very recently. What did you make of the surface? Um, start with the first one because uh, I know you like your tactics and you're good at it as well. Um, and I would love to have a coffee and chat about that as well at some point because I love to have those chats. Um, um, I, what, I, what we did learn, we learned a lot because we played a, a lot against this and, and you always learn something. And, and the one thing that this team have really learned is to know that it takes patience, meaning mental patience, not slow on the ball, but it takes patience to break down. You see on the men's side, you see and on the women's side, you see in Champions League, you see in, in um, big tournaments, it's very difficult when there's no space behind the back line. And Uzbekistan did a fantastic job in the first half. I have to credit them. The way they work for each other, how hard they work, the defensive, look at the Chinese Taipei game, similar. Um, and I think it was a mature performance in the sense that we didn't panic uh, and we kept breaking them down until the spaces opens up. But the other thing that we did learn watching videos, and we're going to have a video session this afternoon before training, is we actually got into the final third a lot, and we got into spaces to play final passes, but the quality and the timing in terms of the final pass execution and finishing wasn't good enough in this game. Was that because we haven't been together for three months? Was it the surface? Was question mark, but that's definitely something we want to improve on and going to work on out on the field today and this afternoon to see the timing and the execution of that final pass and the finishing. Luke. Oh, sorry. Second question. What's your Gross. pitch? Oh, sorry. It's definitely a pitch we can play our football on, um, but I think it's extremely important that we water it a lot. Because uh, right now it, it's the ball sticks in the grass as of right now when it's this dry, uh, so we definitely need to water it a lot to get you know a fast surface that we can play fast football on. I'm just going to bring someone in very quickly. Bit of an entrance, Minister Zanopoulos. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Minister's just going to say some words at the end of this press conference. Great. Sorry. Um, go on to Luke. Uh, Luke Doherty, Fox Sports News. Tony, um, we. The Dubai camp, uh, flight to Tashkent, freezing conditions, back to Dubai in the heat, back here 36 plus potentially tomorrow. How do you try and, I guess, account for all of that in your preparation for this game to ensure that everyone's A, healthy, but not gassed as well when they get out there with all of that? It's a lot of travel to take in a lot of different conditions. And, and Steph, the three years to another World Cup, four years to another Olympics, obviously you've got to qualify first, I agree that, but how important and desperate is it to ensure with this group that you walk away with something tangible from Paris as well, um, given that it's such a tight group, such an amazing group, the public has also grafted themselves onto? Um. This group have shown over the years that they are tremendous professionals in terms of taking care of themselves. Um, we spoke about it traveling here to say we need to be the best the best travelers in the world in terms of knowing how to travel, whether that is nutrition or whether it's refueling, whether it's compression pants, stretching, stretching protocol, jet lag protocol. I have a lot of experts around me uh, that I put a lot of trust to in terms of my physios, my sports science, my doctors, my assistants and all those together with the professionalism from the players. There's never going to be an optimal circumstance when you fly that much uh, and you have jet lag and you have the different temperature and such. But I know one thing and that is these players never complain no matter what's thrown at them. They go out there and give it 100 uh, from what 100 means, meaning no matter what they have, they're going to give that 100 that they have on that day and I know they're going to do that tomorrow as well. Sorry, Chris, uh, Steph? Me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I think with this group, we have come very, very close to achieving something physical. At the last Olympics, the World Cup, we finished fourth. Um, and that's something that sits pretty heavy within this group. And um, we obviously are all getting a little bit older now, and the opportunities for major tournaments is getting thinner. And we're definitely very motivated to get something physical out of the last however many years that we've built this team up to the point that we are now and 
I think the football we've played, especially over the last couple of years, we're competing with the best in the world consistently and we want to continue to do that for as long as we can. But obviously, you know, you look at the core group um, of this team and we are definitely sort of running out of opportunities and uh, we have to qualify for the Olympics first, but we definitely see this as a massive opportunity to, to get something physical out of what we've done over the last few years and um, yeah the passion and desire to do that is, is definitely there. For the Can next I add one thing to that and just add one thing um, I know the motivation and the passion this group where is uh, and it's a privilege to work with them every day and how hard they work every single day it's like what do you do when no one is watching uh, you know how do you sleep how do you eat how do you train put the extra hours in and I, and I know how hard these group of players have worked for so many years and even the, the generation before them to, to be where we are today with this team I think there's different measure of success. Uh, I think even if we didn't medal in the Olympics, even if we didn't medal in the World Cup, uh, I put the word success to it anyway, because there's a bigger why with this team, and that's inspire, inspire a new generation of players and, and bring women's football on the map for real. And I think that is a success itself. But when it comes to medal, uh, I really want that for the players. I want that for Steph, and I want that for the players, for them to get some tangible to have there. So for that sake, I, I really going to do everything in my power to help you get that because you deserve it. Next couple of questions, if we can just start with a single question and if we have time, we'll switch around over here and then at the back. Hi, Steph, uh, Tony. Uh, <coughs> Olympic squads uh, go down to 18 players. Um, you've been through this process before, um, culling players or, or tightening squads. Um, what, what's, it like that, what's it like from a player's perspective, you know, knowing that it's maybe more competitive than a normal international window and, and maybe turn and get your perspective on what it looks like for you coming into the Olympics when you take a broader squad in and then make the decisions closer to the tournament. Yeah, I think from a player's perspective, obviously it's tough when the squad's a lot smaller, but I think it definitely creates competition for spots, which is a massive advantage as well because you get the most out of the players in every position. Um, so yeah, it can be testing times, it's obviously not nice from a player's perspective to see players not get picked for squads, um, but it's you know prestigious to play at the Olympics and um, I think it means that you've got a team full of players that are really in form, um, that can really contribute at all times and obviously that means different rotations and, and things like that. But um, yeah, obviously we've created a lot of depth over the years and um, I think now we're in a position where that is a really challenging task for Tony to pick a squad of 18 and I don't envy him for that at all but I think it'll be a, a, an amazing squad going into the Olympics and um, really put us in a good position to medal there hopefully. No, I can admit it's the toughest part of the coaching job is to to um, have to select players, especially when you're that emotionally invested in a group of people for so long. It's the fourth year now and I love this team. Um, to then have to say to someone that actually deserves to be there, that there's no spot for you, uh, that is the toughest part of this job, I admit that. Um, I think it's going to also be the toughest uh, decisions uh, throughout the tournaments that I've had. I had three major tournaments before, this is the fourth, and it's going to be the toughest one because the competition for spots is so great right now. We built depth over the years. So there's more players that are good enough and deserve to be in the roster that's going to be selected. So there's going to be players left out that is actually good enough to be there. Um, and I'm sure we're going to have a big debate and discussion about who is selected once we come to that day as well. Uh, but let's let's park that for right now because I feel I get stressed when I talk about it. <laughs> uh, and enjoy the game tomorrow. Um, in terms of the process, um, it, because I've said to myself I'm going to be better explaining than I were the, were the first year when I didn't explain good enough to you my processes. So, so when it comes to the selection process, how we look at it is there's always going to be a core um, group of players going into the tournament. They understand the tactics, the values, the culture, the chemistry is there, they understand. So it's not always the best players, the best team. Um, and if you look at that in the Olympic squad, what we do is we look at normally, normally we look at three centre-backs, three outside backs, three centre mids, three centre 7-11s, three 9 and 10s. That's 15. That leaves one spot open. And that can be a multifunctional player because you need depth, or it can be a role player coming off the bench to do a certain thing, close out a game or score a goal, for example. That's most likely the base and the structure of how we're going to build the roster once we come to that day. Two questions from Clint. Tony, uh, Clint Stanway from Channel 9. What, what the girls have built so far and what they have the potential to keep building on. How infectious is that as a, as a coach and why does that make you a better coach, do you think? And one to Steph just about 
your backyard, not Marvel Stadium, but Melbourne and Melbourne's East, growing up in Melbourne's East. How many tickets have you been asked for for tomorrow night? <laughs> Should I answer that first? Yeah. Um, yeah, every person I know I feel like has been on my back for a ticket this time around. Um, they are really hard to come by and we actually don't have that many, so it's been quite a selection process. For I've left it to my family most most of the time because I, I don't want to have to deal with that, but they've got lots and lots of friends coming and the whole family will be there, so I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Tony gave me some tickets too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least we can do uh, captain being in Melbourne playing and uh, the support we've got here every time we play is amazing. Um, so I can't wait to, to connect with, with the family. As you know, in the World Cup as well, they're a massive part of this team. Uh, we always circle up with the family as well. So you know, we talk about the circle when we huddle up and that family and the extended family and friends is part of that as well. It's massive for this team. And that brings me to your question, when, what, what does this team mean and what does it do to me as a coach? I think every day I work with this team, I, I learn something and get better. I get inspired by the people, by the staff, by the players, uh, by everyone that works in, in Australia and in, in football and, and want to really grow the game and leave it better than it was when they, when they entered. And this group of people stand for something that I'm valuing and why I think I, I wanted the job and why I love working with this team is that I, my view of success is not always lifting a trophy and doesn't mean I don't want to win. Don't misinterpret me now, please, because I, I really want to win and people that knows me know how much I want to win and how much I hate to lose. Uh, but I also know that uh, lifting that trophy can be fireworks for a day and then it can feel empty the day after. I've seen it and I've felt it. And it needs to be something bigger than just the trophy or the medal around your neck. It needs to be the heart beating on the back side of it as well. And this heart of this team and what they stand for is amazing. So that makes me a reminder about what life is about, what sport is about, that is so much more than 90 minute football. And that makes me not just a better coach, but a better person. Erin, then Anna. Thanks, Anne. Um, Steph, just one for you. Just wanted to talk, obviously, a few new faces and a few returning faces in the camp. What it's been like for you as a captain trying to get everyone, I guess, playing in that chemistry Tony was talking about in such a short camp? Yeah, it can be difficult. Um, I think, like Tony said, we do obviously have a great consistency in this team so a lot of us have played together for a long long time and sometimes it can be challenging when a new player comes in because you're so used to playing with someone else and you're used to their movements and the way that they play but I think it's a credit to the players that have come in um, straight away at training they've they've been at an incredible level technically tactically they've taken in everything that we do as a team and um, you know put that into practice straight away I think if you look at Caitlin Torpy coming in, obviously, first camp. She did great on the field and fitted in really well. And then Michelle coming off the bench after so many years and not being part of it. Um, it's an absolute credit to them and, and what they're able to do on and off the field. Um, but yeah, it, it can be a challenge, but I think it's it's amazing what they can do as players to come into a, a setup and, and still make an impact and not disturb what's already there as well. Um, so yeah, that's been fun to watch. Anna, and then final question to Luke. Um, Steph, just Tony mentioned before the pitch is one he sees you could play your football on, just got to make sure it's watered to not stick. In terms of your players, in terms of your bodies, um, we've talked about pinks, been on there, we know it's a hard surface with the car park underneath anyway, you know that as a Melvinian. Um, <laughs> what have you made of it having a look at it out there and do you have any concerns about it? Yeah, to be fair, I think it looks good. I think if you hadn't have told me there was a concert on it, Tony told me as well. I, I might not have known. I'm used to it sort of being that hard. I think that's um, initially the first thing I think about is sort of what footwear, and it's pretty obvious because it is so hard. Um, but, yeah, it, it looks like it's in good, in good nick. It'd probably be the opposite sort of of what we've just played on, so that might be a little bit of adjusting. But I think in terms of playing good football, it, it's perfect, and we've played on it before, and it's something that we're absolutely used to. So... Um, in terms of everything that we're sort of overcoming for this trip, that's probably quite low on the list. Um, but yeah, I think everyone's just excited for a big crowd and it's a flat surface, it's a good surface, so we're, we're ready to go. And finally, Luke. Tony, from a, a mindset perspective, starting a game effectively 3-0 up, does that change how you address the players prior to the game, um, knowing that your opponents have probably got a different mindset from, from leg one as well and just the, the variable that that sort of you don't get many home and away matches with 
this team usually one out sort of matches or do or die situations. So yeah, just starting three nil up. <laughs> yeah, it does impact because it's the first half and the second half, uh, like I said. But a lot of these players are used to that in Champions League uh, when they play those rounds uh, of playoffs, which I think is an important experience to tap into as a coach. Um, I also have a lot of experience of doing it, and we actually spoke about it going into that first game, what we want to try to get out of it. For example, one thing we talked about was the discipline defensively, to make sure we keep a clean sheet in a way and don't give away any goals and be really extremely disciplined and keeping a clean sheet. And I think that discipline was there in that first game was very important. Am I glad that we got three goals? Yes. Uh, but it also means now that we have a little bit of an advantage starting this game because maybe their patience and time uh, is not the same in terms of that low block uh, in order to, to compete to go through. And that means maybe opens up some more space uh, for us. Uh, and the other thing is as well, once the game starts, we are through. When the game begins, we are through on a tie. Uh, it doesn't mean we're going for a tie, but you said mindset. We know we're, we're through when the game starts unless we give something up. Uh, but we are never going to change our attacking mindset. Uh, I tell you that. When we go out tomorrow, we're going to fly forward from the second one. Even if it's heat, we're not going to hold anything back. We're going to run in behind. We're going to break lines. We're going to regain the ball. We're going to go attack, attack, attack. And that's the way we're going to try to approach the game.